to you. How you doing this morning? Hope you're doing good. Uh, we got uh, some announcements we want to uh, tell you at this time before we get started. Oh, Vicky, come on over here and talk to us. Good morning, everyone. Just a quick announcement. On behalf of the Pastoral Search Committee and the SPR committees, we're thrilled to announce that God has answered our prayers for a new pastor. Please join us in welcoming Pastor Brian Widmer, his wife, Jamie, their sons, Asher and Hayes, to the Union Chapel Church family. And I want to say a special thanks to the Pastoral Search Committee. They've done an awesome job. Their job is not finished. There's a lot more work to do for them and for all of us. So keep them in your prayers. Keep Pastor Brown and his family in your prayers. See you every Sunday to come. Thank you. Okay, let's give Brown a hand again. Congratulations to you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. It is good to see everybody in the house of the Lord today. So glad you could come worship with us. For those of you who are watching online, we appreciate you tuning us in on the YouTube. For those of you who are listening by the way of radio, on uh, 102.5 FM, that is WKUN, and also on AM 1490 WKUN. And I think by next Sunday, we will be streaming uh, as well on uh, WKUN.com. So we're looking forward to that. So this church has a lot of ways to reach people whether they're shut in or at home or just can't make it to the service. So if you want to go back and listen, uh, on the YouTube, I know anytime during the week, that's always good to know, good to know. But we appreciate everybody coming. Now, yesterday uh, was dove season. Uh, if you live out here in a rural area like we do, it's dove season, but it was also duck season yesterday. <laughs> you know, I see a lot of people wearing red in here today. Where'd y'all find all that red at? Dan Lanning, the head coach of the Oregon Ducks, who you know used to coach here at Georgia for two or three years, uh, I think he's almost ashamed to go back home. Uh, I would. I'd be ashamed to only put up three points. But anyway, uh, Georgia looks like they're on the road to another national championship. Of course, Nick Saban would have something to say about that. But anyway, we enjoyed football season kicking off. Had some great high school games. If y'all listen to them on the radio, WMOQ and WKUN, uh, we'll have some more this week. Now, going back to the dove thing, I'm always people always invite me to a dove cookout, dove barbecue, dove supper, and everything. And you know me, only thing I've ever turned down in my life has been my collar. Now, I've turned it down a bunch of times, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, I, did, I didn't make it to a lot of those dove suppers. One time, we didn't kill enough doves to have a, a barbecue like on a pit. You know, Harry, we only had seven or eight birds, and we just put them in a pot and made a stew out of them. 
And I told them all, I said, if y'all drink enough tea, you'll eventually get full. So we've been there. My first dove I ever killed in my life. My daddy took me dove hunting. I'd been shooting with a BB gun. And one year he said, son, it's about time that we get you a shotgun. And he took me down to Peters and Foster and bought me a 410 shotgun. And we went and shot doves and my daddy hit one and it went down in top of a pine tree, 40 foot tall. And my daddy said, run down there and kill that bird. This will be your first dove you ever shot. I run down there and he said, he hollered and said, can you see him? I said, yeah, I see him, daddy. He said, well, shoot him. But what he didn't know was the bird had fell 30 foot from the top of the tree and he was only about five foot above my head. And he kept saying, shoot him, shoot him. So I shot him. Nothing but feathers come down. The only thing left was a hind leg. And I picked it up and took it back to him and said, here you go, daddy. My mama cooked it and that's what I had for supper that night. Okay, that, that's, that's enough about the dove shooting. Uh, anybody else got any announcements? Becky, you got choir practice. 7 o'clock Wednesday night. If you want to be a member of the choir, Harry. Spruce it up. We've got homecoming coming up the next Sunday. So next uh, Saturday from 9 to noon, if you can come out and help us spread pine straw, I've got a load of... Uh, uh, playground mulch, new mulch to be spread on the playground. It'll be here uh, before Saturday this week, so we can get that done. So anything, anybody can come out, uh, bring your rakes, a uh, wheelbarrow or a shovel or pruners or whatever you want to come up. Just come on out around 9 o'clock Saturday morning. Okay. You counting on everybody being here, okay? Uh, somebody else? Cindy, you got an announcement? Yeah, but it's actually going to be the 25th. Uh, Kenneth and I are out of town next week, so there is a cross-fire. Okay. Also, starting this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock yes. is our youth Bible study at the house. Again. So youth Bible uh, study at Kenneth and Cindy's house Tuesday night. Okay. Be there, be square. Okay, y'all got that. Men's breakfast out here in the fellowship hall, 7 o'clock Wednesday morning. Don't forget that, Okay. Start your day off right with prayer and with breakfast. Glenn. Men's club this Thursday night. Low country ball. Danny Ather. Okay. All right. He's got the recipe that nobody else has got. Okay. We'll look forward to that this Thursday night, 7 o'clock. Okay. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn. And let's everybody stand up. This is an old-time tune. goes way back. It's a traditional tune. Don't know the writer because it's come from the old country over in England. We're going to sing it. The words are on the screen. You've heard this many times, but we're going to sing, Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Let's, uh, let's sing uh, one out of the celebrational hymnal now, number five, uh, 502. We're going to sing the first and third verse on that. In my heart there rings a melody. Oh, 
Okay, we want you to turn around and shake hands, tell everybody it's good to see them. Ain't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Chapel Church. Thank you for being here this morning. You may be seated briefly. Actually, um, just kidding. We're just working on this here. If you'll stay standing with me, we're going to go through the Apostles' Creed, and then we're going to have the children's moment, which may have already happened. So if you will um, just repeat after me. With me, please. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the everlasting. Amen. Miss Cindy is coming down front to do the children's moment. You may be seated. Uh huh. David don't want to share the red one anymore. All right. All right. Come on, Pommy. Have a seat. We got everybody. We're missing Davis. She's coming. All right. Here we go. All right. How's everybody doing today? Good. All right. It's kind of a lazy daisy day. Miss Cindy brought something with her today. I brought some of my favorite stuffed animals that I just love. I got, look at there, got my goat. Get your goat. That's funny. Okay. Um, got a moo cow. All right. Yeah. What else we got? Oh, Lord. Got another goat. I got my bunny. I got my, I got my wolf. I'm missing something. Oh, I'm missing my, no, the sheep. Okay. He's somewhere, y'all. We got to find that sheep. Where's he at? Oh, man. That's my favorite. Where's my sheep? Where's my sheep? Where do y'all see him? Do you see him? Where's he at? Where's he at? Oh, there he is. Cool. Now the day is good. You know, I Jesus, if Jesus was looking for a sheep, you know what he would have done? 
throwing him over the back like this. And he'd have hollered and said, hey, everybody, we're going to have a party. I found my lost sheep. That's kind of silly, isn't it? You think, my goodness, probably they had 99 more sheep. But why worry about that one? Because that's who Jesus is. We're all his sheep. Did you know that? Yeah. I'd be like little Davis. All of a sudden, we miss little Davis. We'd all be looking hard for that little sheep, wouldn't we? Yeah. You did? Yeah, those little sheep can get in crazy places. So we have to remember, in the book of Luke, it tells us how even though there's a hundred sheep, if even one is missing, Jesus is going to look for it. And we are those little sheep. And we get lost. You know how we get lost? It's, it's okay. Is that we don't talk to him. Do y'all pray to Jesus all the, all the time? Talk to him? Do you read his word? Do you go to church? See, all of those things, and when we get away, and we're not talking to him, we're little lost sheep. But, you know, he's standing there. He's always looking for us to come back and to talk to him and to read about him and to tell others about him. So we need to always remember that he cares about all his sheep, every one of us, okay? All right, any special prayer requests today? Everybody good? All right, let us pray. Dear sweet Jesus, we just thank you so much that you love us. You will go to the ends of the earth looking for us. You always want us to talk to you, to read about you, Lord, and to tell others about you. Help us, Father, not to get lost. But I'm thankful, Father, that when we are, you're looking for us. You're always waiting for us to come back. Help us, Lord, to help others get back too. Thank you for your love and your guidance and all your many blessings. In Jesus' most loving and precious name. And all God's sweet children said, amen. Thank you. And hey, guys, we miss you. We want to see you here. You're our little lost sheep. of thanksgiving and giving to ourselves to the Lord and giving what God has blessed us with. So I'm going to pray over the offering. Um, and all of you are invited to walk down front, give your offering to the Lord, and do it with a happy face and be excited about what God's doing here at Union Chapel. I know that I am, and I'm excited to get to know each and every one of you. Bow your head. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the many blessings that you give our families and that you give us. Lord, we thank you for our time, our talents, our treasures, and we want to be diligent to use each and every advantage that you give us to impact the kingdom and to do large things in our community. Lord, um, some of us have seasons of, of a lot of time, and then some we're blessed with overabundance of opportunity and wealth, and we ask that, that you give us an idea of how to steward that well, that we'll gladly give back that will sow into what um, grows the best, and that is promised to give a return, and that's the work of the Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done and your investment into us, and we now are happy to say that we can invest back into the things you're doing in this town. We gladly give to you, and we thank you for all that you've given to us, and then we promise to you that all that you give will be accounted for and given back. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Becky. As you can tell, they threw me into the fire this morning. Um, I'm used to John being by my side, and he tugs me, he pushes me, he trips me, whatever it takes to get me to where I'm supposed to be. So thank you for your patience and your incredible welcome to my family. Um, I look forward to to talking more in just a little bit with you. But now we want to remember all of the loved ones here, our family that maybe um, are visiting or that are members and that have concerns. We want to be a place of prayer. We want to love in a praying way with you, our love of the Lord. And so we want to remember everybody that's on our concerns. If you want to look on your bulletin, your worship guide, whatever you choose to call it, we've got a lot of good things in there to pray over this week. We want to remember the family of John Hollis. We want to remember that family and pray for healing, um, prayer for Connie Briscoe as she recovers from heart surgery. There's many more. Uh, if, if you'd like to add, we'd love to get you on here. You can either call the office staff or meet with um, one of us individually, and we'd love to get you on here. And then we're going to make a habit um, after the service or just as we close to make sure there's time for you guys to be prayed over and to open some time that we can, as a church congregation, come around, support, and love. I'm going to pray now, um, and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Dear Jesus, once again, thank you for Sundays and thank you for opportunities, whatever day it is, to be around each other, to have camaraderie and to have Christendom and to have the Ecclesia, the church that strengthens each other. Iron sharpens iron, and we appreciate every opportunity and safe space to do that. Thank you for everyone that you've brought in, whether they feel like they belong, they're looking for belonging, or they've just wandered in. We are thankful that you brought them to this loving family today. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing, and we look forward to the future and the wonderful things that you have in store. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They are daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. Into temptation, but the power and the glory forever. Amen. When the trouble would break our cage, help his mighty tongue shall sound, and the end of the age proclaiming shall be the best profound. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory to take the saints on God, for the shining with the stars of the multitude that rise, change in the twinkling of an eye, change freely in the twinkling of an eye.
changed in the twinkling of an eye can you go back can you go back and sing the, sing that last chorus can you do it one more time can you do it can you do it let's do it one more time let's do it let's do it I told all my troubles goodbye goodbye to me Thank you so much. Your hard work and all that you do to inspire us and sing and bring beautiful music to us. <clears throat> While the choir is coming down, if you will take your Bible and turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. I want to take this time just to thank everybody for your kindness and welcoming my family. Today's a big day for, for us personally because all of my family is in church. I have my father and mother-in-law, my wife is here, and my two boys are here. And this has been um, a huge thing in my life is just excited to bring the family to church. I'm excited to be all in one place and having a four-year-old and a one-year-old and kind of teaching here sometimes and going there. We've been split up for a, a portion of our time on sabbatical. So you guys have provided a place for my family, a home to come together. And so I'm just overly joyed and grateful for Union Chapel. All that's been here, all that you've done has paved the way for this day for us to be together. And your kindness to my family will never be forgotten. I want to tell you from the bottom of my heart that we're excited to be here. We're excited to be with you. And I'm thankful for such a spirit of um, 
of welcomeness. I just, we feel very welcome here. So thank you. That's not something that happens overnight. That's a long time coming. And that really shows the heart of the Lord. Thank you so much. First Samuel chapter 17 is where we'll be today. We started off, um, when I first came, we were kind of looking at two weeks. So we, we grabbed into Ephesians and then we looked at last week, Samuel um, coming in to anoint David as the new king. Saul was um, kind of displaced or he's there, but God's saying, I'm done with you. And we looked at big pictures and small pictures. We looked at there's a large thing going on and then there's some small things going on. I looked at um, the conversation that even when people are rejected of men, it usually those are the ones that become beloved by the Lord. That David's years away from family or not in the home or not included were not wasted times. They were training times. And that his public anointing was from a cultivation of um, private encounter. That his, his encounters daily with the Lord is what led to the, the big public anointing in front of his family. If you remember, um, Samuel had all of Jesse's sons, all seven Minus one come in and parade through and God did not choose to anoint them, but they brought this last younger boy in and God said, that's the one, that's the one that's going to be my chosen. He is a man after my own heart. David's known as the man after God's own heart. This public anointing, this public um, display came from a day in and day out life lived for God. I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Samuel 17. We're going to read a good portion. We'll be all over. There may be some things on the screen. If you have a Bible, please open it up. If you look on a phone or a tablet, jump in. Verse 1, Now the Philistines gathered their army to battle, and they were gathered at Soka, which belonged to Verse 3, And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley in between. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him, and he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I divide the ranks of the Israel of Israel this day. Give me a man that will fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed. They were scared and greatly afraid. Verse 45, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you unto my hand. When the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle. And he met the Philistine, and David put his hand in his bag and took out a smooth stone and slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. Let's pray. God, open your word. Lord, allow us to see it and it to see us. Allow us to hear from you and you to hear from us. Point out the things under a microscope in our lives that need to be changed to be more like you. Lord, allow us to learn from other men and women in the Bible stories that are factual and true that will shake us to the core and make us more like you. We look for your guidance, we look for your protection, and we look to learn today. Thank you for your perfect word that's inerrant, that's been written thousands of years ago, that still lives 
and divides our, our soul and spirit and lets us know the way we should go. Thank you for your spirit and your communication for those around that we can bounce ideas off of and work through this spiritual journey together. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Friends online or on the radio, if you're with us, let's dive into this story a little bit deeper. You see the scripture and you may think, um, when I began to study, I almost didn't want to go on to chapter 7, 17, just because I feel like David and Goliath is something we all know pretty well. Um, either you've heard it in a sports analogy, you've heard it in um, Sunday school or in uh, some kind of a Bible class, a Bible setting, if you haven't already heard it in church. And we might think for a moment, man, I know that this little kid comes, he has a sling, he does something really wild, he slings a rock and kills a giant and becomes a hero. Yes, that's the story, but there's much bigger things going on here. And I'd like to kind of take you through the storyline and the history of time. In the beginning of 1 Samuel, in chapter 4, the Philistines come and pick a fight with Israel, and they beat Israel single-handedly. They kill the priest's sons, and they take the Ark of the Covenant captive. They steal this ark, and this ark is carried everywhere. It represents the goodness of God. It represents his presence with them, and the Philistines thought they could take it and, and simply do away with Israel, but God had bigger plans. In 1 Samuel 13 and 14, the Philistines um, again tried to pick a fight, but the Israelites prevailed over them and beat them soundly. No doubt during this time, there's conversations of Samuel having a fallen out with Saul and Saul not being the leader he needs to be and God beginning to move away. So it seems like a perfect time for the Philistines to come back and get revenge, part three. They're ready to get what they've been fighting for, and that's defeat over the Israelites. They think they have a pretty good game plan. They think they got this massive guy, Goliath, that if he can intimidate and with arrogance, curse God and God's people. Um, he even brings up in the scripture, remember, we killed some of your priest's sons and took the, the presence of the God of God in the ark. We stole that from you. Remember that? He, he kind of goes in with words and tries to antagonize these people to a bigger fight. Saul and the Israelite army were terrified. They were scared to death. They saw this gargantuan man, this big guy, this battle-hardened um, champion, and they were scared. The irony is, if you remember, Saul was chosen because of his stature, because of his fighting ability, because he was, at one point, a very high-end fighter himself. This went on for 40 days. So if you picture it, <clears throat> on the west coast of Israel, going towards the Gaza Strip in Palestine, there's one huge mountain range that cuts through, and there's a lot of little mountainous areas. We talked um, last week about Bethlehem and Hebron and some of these towns that were cut in and had roads. The Philistines are coming up the road. They're on enemy territory. They're in Judah. They're in Israel's home, and they're telling them we're coming to battle and this stalemate where one side, um, the Philistines, their meat and potatoes, they're, they're good part of their army. They have chariots and they're really good at fast, quick, um, surprise and hard fighting. But you can't really cruise um, a chariot through the mountains. You can't really go in quick and you've got to be super nimble. And I don't know... Um, I wasn't there, but I don't see a 10-foot guy sprinting and moving and, and, and ducking and being real good at getting in and out of some of this rocky terrain. And then you have the Israelites who were a, a smaller, more tactical. They had bows and arrows, but with all of the undulation and the ups and downs, it's really hard to get a good shot. So you kind of have this situation painted that both people didn't really want to fight, but they were ready to fight. But there really wasn't a good place to have this battle. So for 40 days, they just go back and forth, maybe small skirmishes or just talking back and forth until Goliath finally says, you know what, I'm going to challenge them. 
Who in their right mind would come against Goliath? If he shows up against the most faithful people, I'm sure they would run. But he didn't account for a little boy named David. He didn't account earlier in the chapter that he would get close to Saul, even though he's his successor by playing his harp and doing things for Saul and serving. He would go home and keep the sheep for his father's or for his father, his father's sheep. Then he would be asked at the end of this to bring food to his brothers. They're camping out for a long time. There's not a lot of food to go around. They're getting, um, I said in first service, the word hangry. It's kind of when you're hungry and angry. When you, when you get kind of super hungry, your emotions start going and you start getting fired up a little bit. David didn't give in to fear or doubt because he remained faithful and busy about his work. Remember what's celebrated in public is made cultivated and stewed in private. What is practiced inside will always be promoted outside. If I had a, a, a Coke um, up here, a, a Coca-Cola classic, a red can, and I shook it up real, real firm and then popped the top, you would expect one thing to happen. You would expect a Coke dark brown substance to spew out. That's what happens. Now, if I did that and popped it open and orange Fanta or um, a Sprite came out, you would think I'm a magician or I did a trick or something different is happening. You see, what happens inside when shook, when things come, is what explodes outside. So here, David is being um, challenged but what comes out loudly is what's silently been devoted every single day. David, like I said, didn't give in to fear because he was busy. I find that personally, I don't know about you, you may be way ahead of me in this spiritual journey, but I know for me that usually when I have time to complain or time to be upset, usually it's when I'm not about the work of the Lord or the busyness that I need to be doing. I find myself when I'm working or diligently going after God and the things that he's asked us to do, that usually my, my head's down, I'm plowing, I'm doing his work, and I'm not really that worried about what everyone else is doing. I see David not overcome with the things around him because he was steadfast in the things inside of him. Pick your battles. I remember hearing that. Growing up, and I never had any idea what pick your battles really meant until I got married. Then I learned quickly there are certain battles that you should pick. That only got me ready to have kids. And then I really found out what pick your battles means. And so for the last 15 years of marriage and the last four years of being a father, I've learned to pick my battles very well. There's several battles in this chapter that I want to call out quickly. There's a reoccurring issue with Israel. There's this thing with Israel where God keeps delivering them. He gives them food when there is no food. He guides them when it's dark with a pillar by fire. He's doing incredible things, but Israel, like you and I, has a short-term memory, and they keep forgetting and going back to this fear and doubt issue. Then there's an ongoing family battle with David, and I'm sure he's dealing with some inside insecurities as well. If you look at the reoccurring issue with Israel, in Scripture we see one continual thing, and that's Israel has a problem constantly with the size of their opponents. If you look early in the Old Testament, you see God says, Canaan land is this beautiful, incredible property, and it's yours. I've made it for you. Israel, go get your land. And they send spies to check it out. And they're like, it is truly the best of the best. The most beautiful fields. It has, you know, fruit the size of Volkswagen bugs. Like this is the biggest, most plentiful place I've ever seen. And someone goes, but wait, do you see the size of the inhabitants? Something really interesting. The people that were in Canaan, the, the large people there came from the same 
origination of Gath and that family line that Goliath ends up coming from here. It's the same um, group of people that had this um, deformity and a tumor on their brain that allowed them to grow bigger than everybody else. I see that the Egyptian army was so big that they were scared to death. And now Goliath stands up and they're like, yet again, why can't we get just some normal folks to fight with? Why can't it be easy? Why can't we just have somebody pick on somebody your own size? But that's not the case. And I see that God calls you and I individually in our family and as a church to be pioneers, to take new spiritual territory, that there's places and schools and neighborhoods that need the Lord that God has already given us inroads to, that he's commanded us to go. And there are little steps that scare us, but God has already promised to give us the land. Maybe it's a job you're looking for that you don't know is right around the corner, but God has already worked it out. In Deuteronomy 121, it says, See, the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession. As the Lord, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you, do not fear or be dismayed. The odds in this chapter, fighting Goliath, are no bigger than anywhere else. The same thing remains that Israel continues to lack faith and they lack godly leadership. God is not limited to a number of warriors. It's not the size of Goliath or the arrogance of his words that should cause us to stop and wonder, but rather unbelief and the fear of God's people. My question to you is who do we fight for? Who do we fight for? Are you often discouraged as I am by the size of the problems we face? May I give you a reminder that I need daily, and that is, remember the size of your God. Remember the power of He who we fight for. There's an ongoing battle in the family. If you remember last chapter, all seven of the boys are paraded out of Jesse's in Bethlehem, and God doesn't pick them. They choose this young guy to come in, their old or their youngest brother. He's the eighth, the baby. He comes in, and God says, that's the one. I'm sure all the other guys are furious because they thought, surely it's me. It's not. They look over all the other ones and pick David. David is told by his father in verse 28 to go and take supplies to his brothers. Now, if I'm living in a camp if I'm listening and being paranoid, waiting for uh, an army to, to start war with me, I'm hungry, I'm going to be pretty excited if anybody comes to talk to me. If anybody brings me some food, um, a Kit Kat, something, a Snickers, like give me something to get me through this, I'm excited. But if you look at what David endures, David shows up with a bunch of goods and his oldest brother Eliab and the next two down begin to make fun of him. They ask, why have you come? And why did you, what did you do with the little sheep that you have? And they're belittling him. And then they kind of judge or charge his heart and say that he's evil. And he only came to be part of the drama and watch the fight. David showed up to do something good. And the people he showed up for publicly humiliated him. Whether your current hardship is spiritual or physical, I want to share with you this morning, I feel like God wants us to know that God cares about them all. He's not only about spiritual matters, He's also about emotional, physical, financial matters. God cares about His children. If it's work, if it's money, if it's kids, nothing takes God by surprise. And God cares about you, me, and all of our heartache. Then I see two guys that kind of come to the forefront, David and Goliath. Goliath is speculated to be nine foot nine inches. That's a big boy. His spear, just the, 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 the end of the spear 
is 15 pounds and his armor away alone weighs 125 pounds. That's a lot of weight. That's a heavy chain mail to fight. But listen, Goliath was picked as their champion, not because of his talent, his calling, or his title. He wasn't set apart because he was a leader in any other aspect than his physical characteristics. Remember what I said, that your physical characteristics can get you the job, can get you the platform, can get you a talent or a title, but your character is what keeps you there. Your character is what sustains that. So Goliath shows up with ability, but he doesn't have spiritual character. David shows up and he tries to put on a bunch of stuff. He puts on uh, Saul's equipment, but it's too heavy. He says, no, I've already done this. I've, I've killed a bear and a lion. Now, if I'm a warrior and I meet with a little kid and he tells me, look, I've got hair from a lion. I just ripped it out of his face. I, I just pulled out his beard. I wanted to keep it so I'd remember. I'd probably give him full leverage to do whatever he wanted. If he tells me, I saw a bear and he came at me and he wanted one of my little sheep and I said, put up your dukes and we went to town and I beat the bear. Here you go, fight. How is it that hard to understand what David's going through and how God has already blessed him? David sets up and this is where he begins to calculate. Being careful is being prudent, cautious, or calculating. Careful and fearful can oftentimes be separation. They can be different. They can be separate words. Careful is cerebral, where fearful is emotional. Both are good, but both have their place. Careful is fueled by information. Fear is fueled by your imagination. Careful calculates risks when fear avoids them. Careful wants to achieve success, but fear wants to avoid failure. Careful in calculation is concerned about progress. Fear is concerned about protection. We learn from David that it only takes one to restore the faith of many. Let me say this to you today. I don't know what you're going through. I know what I go through and my family does on a daily basis, but you see a whole country who's fallen off of their spiritual journey because of Saul. One young kid fights one of the biggest battles of his life and because of his steadfastness, because of his walk with God, it changes the relationship spiritually with the entire country. What you're going through may be bad and it may be tough. I will not take anything away from that, but what God may be doing is using this in your life to totally change the events in someone else's spiritual walk. He may be using this church and maybe some some hiccups or some shakes to do something in someone else's life. What is God trying to restore in your battles? Goliath presented a great threat, but he also presented a better opportunity. You know, the difference between those two threats and opportunities fall between perspective. How do we see things? If our faith is in God and our faith is a daily walk, our discipleship is real, we see threats as opportunities for miracles, not opportunities for fear. My question to you, friends and family, this morning is what life situation has you on the run? What are you dealing with in your life that that feels really big or looks gigantic? God wants to train you and me in the same way that he used this story in David's life. God is always there with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to teach you about himself every day. God wants you and I to invite him into every part of our life, even the small stuff. If we abide in Him and remain in Him every day and obey in the small things, 
We will be easy. It'll be easier for us to rely on him in the big deals without hesitation. Friends, I'd like to pray and just begin a time of reflection as we close the service. I'd like to be down front as an opportunity, one, just to to get to know you and hug your neck after the service. But for now, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're going through. But if today's a day that you feel God telling you, hey, let's walk down front. Brian, I just want to pray by myself. Julio, I just kind of want to have some time with God. There's places down here for that. Becky, do you mind playing something during this moment? Is that okay? Um, It doesn't even have to be a congregational song, maybe just something quiet for a few minutes. Or Julio, if you have something else, that's fine. But I'm going to step down front. I'm going to pray and close. And then um, right at the end, we can, um, you can close if if you'd like, David. How about that? Let me pray over you guys. Lord, I pray that if this is a time that you want to open up your altar, if somebody needs encouragement or prayer, Union Chapel wants to be a part of miracles and healing. We don't want to not be a part of what you're doing. We're watching you work in the scriptures and in our teachings. What a tragedy not to watch you work in our own congregation. This town, our families, and this community thrives on what you're doing. We want to be a part of it. So as we pray, as we spend time, if you'd like to come down front, I would love to pray over your family or just to say a prayer and and jot down some notes so we can pray this week as a church over you. If we can be an encouragement or serve in any way, while Becky prays and while Julio leads, we invite you to walk down front. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brian. We decided a long time ago when y'all asked me to do this, I said, we're going to let the Lord lead our service. That's what we need to do, y'all. Let the Lord lead our service. And I told Brian today, I said, I feel like the Lord is here today. He's here trying to tell us something. He's trying to bring our church together. He's trying to build something. And we got something to build on. I'm going to tell y'all something. Our God is a big God. Nothing is impossible with God. He can do anything. And you've heard him say he can move a mountain. Amen. He can. He can do the impossible. I know that I've I've brought my troubles to the to the altar here. When I was told about eight years ago I had leukemia. And I knelt right there and the whole church come down here and prayed for me. And without those prayers, and without God answering those prayers, I wouldn't be standing up here today. I think we need to take time to come down to the altar and pray today. Whatever you're going through, whatever your problem is, it's not too big for God. You might have got a bad report from a doctor. You may have some bad news about your job. Family problems, sickness, whatever it is, bring it to the Lord. I'd like for us all to come down here and stand, or kneel, whatever. I'd like for you to come down here today. I don't know what Becky's going to play, but we're going to let the Lord lead our service. Amen? We need to turn our problems over to the Lord because He's the way, the only way out. And as the choir sang that song today, it ain't going to be long. And one day that trumpet's going to sound. Then what are you going to do? But let's all come down here and pray to the Lord. And we're going we're gonna to just play this by ear and let the Lord lead it. But come on down. If you can't kneel, you can stand. You can stand over here on these steps. Lean over on the rail. But come down and let's pray for the healing of this church, this community, this state, this country of ours. We're in a mess, y'all. This country's in a mess. We need to turn all our problems over to the Lord. 
And let's unite and let's come together. Whatever your problem is today, we're going to give it to the Lord today. If we, if we can all take our seats, we're going to sing our closing hymn here in just a minute. Amen. Oh, it's good to see this all to fill up today. We all need prayer. You can take your prayer to the Lord because He's the one. He's the one that can do it. Nothing. It's too big for God. Amen. Nothing is impossible with God. I'd like for you to stand and let's sing. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, my sins and grace to me. 
you feel like you've been in the house of the Lord today, say amen. Amen, I do. Amen. That's what we come here to do is have church. I believe we had church today. We want to thank Brian for a great job and we look forward to seeing him next Sunday. And from now on, good to see you. Going to look for you back here next Sunday. I want you to do something for me. I want you to bring a friend with you. I want you to tell somebody. Say, come go to church with me this Sunday. We'll have a good time in the Lord, good singing, good preaching, and we'll all pray together. May we be, may we be dismissed now. Dear Lord, thank you for letting us come into your house today, Lord. Thank you for leading our service. Thank you for sending down the Holy Spirit today, Lord. Thank you for the great music, Lord. Thank you that we can all come together and share our burdens together and give them to you. Lord, we ask your blessings on our church, on our community. Lord, lead and guide us through this upcoming week. Bring us all back safe here again next Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.